Hi, everybody. I'm Pete Barrett, the Public Relations Director for the Airline History Museum at Kansas City. This not-for-profit organization exists to celebrate the rich history of propeller-driven commercial aviation here in this country. Throughout the tape you're about to see, there will be an 800 number across the bottom of the screen and a website address. We encourage you to look us up on the web, to call, and to join. What you're about to see is a unique piece of aviation history. Back in the 50s, Eastern Airlines was looking for a way to publicize the introduction of their newest airliner, the Lockheed Super G Constellation. What better way to do it than to hire one of the most prominent stars of radio and television in the 40s and 50s, Mr. Arthur Godfrey. Mr. Godfrey was not only a star in his own right, he was well known nationwide for being a spokesperson for aviation. He, in fact, owned his own DC-3 airliner for a number of years. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker of Eastern hired Mr. Godfrey to do the film you're about to see publicizing the introduction of the Lockheed Super G Constellation. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Flying with Godfrey. to be a movie about flying, one of my very favorite subjects. In fact, there's nothing I'd rather talk about, especially during this 50th anniversary year of powered flight. Of course, I like to talk about radio and television, too. They've been mighty good to this country, boy. This is the way I make my living. But what makes that living worthwhile is to get out there in the wild blue yonder, in a good airplane, with the whole universe waiting for me. Not just because it's a thrill, although it certainly is that, but because I like to think that aviation, as far as it has advanced, and it certainly has come a long way, is still very young. Oh, we've come a long way since the days when my good friend the ace of aces, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, used to fly around in France in those spads. The dean of aviation. Just think, he's been flying for nearly 40 years. Why, it's only 50 years since the Wright brothers. You know, they call me one of the old timers in aviation, but I didn't begin to fly in earnest until 1929. Gosh, that's almost 25 years ago now, isn't it? You know, I've done more flying in the last three years than I did in the first 22. Here, let me show you. I have been commissioned in the Naval Reserve since 1939, but because of an old injury to my legs, the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery wouldn't clear me for military airplane flying until 1950. So it was in 1950, in September, that I got my Navy wings at Pensacola, the happiest day of my life. Since that time, I have qualified as a carrier pilot, as a jet pilot, as a helicopter pilot, and here is the coveted Navy green ticket, the highest instrument rating given to Navy pilots. Of course, I'm very proud of all of these military certificates. But here's one here that makes me very, very, very happy. This is the certificate that Captain Eddie Rickenbacker gave me recently, making me an honorary captain in Eastern Airlines. As I was saying, planes have come a long way in the last 50 years. Here's one very much like the one that the Wright brothers used. Used to make 40 to 50 miles an hour. 
There's still one or two of these around, too. It's a funny-looking affair, but most of the basic principles we use today were developed in this plane. It didn't fly high, and it didn't fly far, but by golly, it flew. Looks kind of like an overgrown box kite, doesn't it? Well, you can take it from me, it feels like one, too, when you're up in it. You've heard the expression, flying by the seat of your pants? Well, this is where it came from. Sitting in this old bucket seat right here. See, the Wright brothers had no instruments of any kind, except a little old oil gauge down here. It tells you you got some oil pressure back there. And this stick, this column, and this wheel is exactly the same as we have in the big airliners of today. When I push the stick forward, notice that flipper comes down, it pushes the tail up and the nose down. Vice versa this way. Want to drop the right wing, do it this way. Left wing this way. And here are the rudder bars that work the rudders in the tail. You see, the principles were the same then as they are today. No difference. Here is a model of a Spad, the airplane that Captain Eddie Rickenbacker flew in World War I, only 10 or 12 years after the Wright brothers' first flight. It's a shame that it had to be used as a weapon of destruction so soon, but the war brought that on. This is Captain Rickenbacker in the plane he made famous in World War I. These old films show the dashing young skipper of the 94th Squadron leading his boys into a dogfight. The hat and the ring insignia was always present when the fighting was thickest. The wild blue yonder was really wild in those days when there was just so much wood and canvas between you and the enemy, between you and the ground. Down in flames was the rule rather than the exception. They had no protection, they had no parachutes. Yes, they paid a high price, but it was through Captain Rickenbacker's exploits in World War I that the terrific fighting power in the airplanes was made known to man. This little spad carried a very powerful engine for those days and often flew up to 135 miles an hour straight down. There aren't many of them left, but here comes one of those old timers now. And look who's flying it. It's Captain Eddie, the one and only. Captain Rickenbacker. Hey, wait a minute. I want to get in this scene myself. Oh, hey, there. Captain Eddie. How are you? <laughs> How's it feel to be at the controls of this old baby again? Well, frankly, it brings back a lot of memories, Arthur. Some good, some not so good, but maybe we had to do it regardless. You know, many a morning I used to sit around up there 20,000 feet with the sun at my back waiting for the enemy fuckers to come around. 20,000 feet in that open cockpit? Right. <whistles> Nowadays we got heated and pressurized cabins. Didn't you get cold? Oh, how? <laughs> it sure was. In fact, we had to come down to thaw out, you know, it gets so cold up there. Yes, Arthur, it's a wonderful little ship in spite of the fact that it's made up of wood and wires and struts and shlack and tape pulled together with all of these wonderful combination of gadgets. The fact of the matter is, the only metal in it, the engine and the machine guns, yes, quite a change. And in 30 years, too. True, and on the other hand, when you take a look at the beautiful super constellation, all metal, one end to the other, aluminum, steel, brass, copper, in fact, every kind of metal known to science is involved in its structure. Just take a look at that super constellation, folks. 114 feet long, with a wingspan of 123 feet. Four of the latest compounded engines of 3,250 horsepower each. Do you realize how much power that is? why each engine has more power than a locomotive. This plane can fly up to around 400 miles an hour, and we are going to take a ride in it. Let's hear what Captain Eddie is saying. Arthur, one of those wheels always almost as much as a span. By the way, here comes your crew. 
Oh, hello, Dick. Hi, Dickie boy. How are you, Captain? How are you? Hello, you. Hello, Captain. Hi, nice you. you. Hello, Captain. Arthur, we're due out of here at 2 o'clock. Just one hour from now. I'm ready. Well, as long as you fellas are going to do the flying, I might as well go on. <laughs> Have a good trip. So okay. long, guys. Thank you, So Captain. long. What a guy. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was quite a guy. In fact, you could probably do a television show based on nothing but anecdotes about Captain Eddie. He first achieved fame as a race car driver, and then during World War I as an ace fighter pilot. After the war, he became a businessman, at one time owning the Indianapolis Speedway. As an airline executive, he developed a reputation for being crusty and, how shall we say it, being a bit tight with the dollar. In fact, for years, he refused to hire female flight attendants. In the 1930s, it was standard practice amongst airlines to ask female flight attendants to quit once they became married. Captain Eddie didn't see the logic in paying to train a female flight attendant and then have her quit relatively soon thereafter. In fact, it was World War II that finally caused Eastern to change their policy because Captain Eddie couldn't get any male flight attendants. Excuse me. Here at the Airline History Museum, we have not only airplanes, but we have artifacts and memorabilia from the golden days of commercial propeller-driven aviation. If you'd like to help us preserve this history, call us at the number on the screen or look us up on the web at www.airlinehistorymuseum.com. We're going to return to our program now, but notice Arthur Godfrey's folksy delivery. He was one of the most desired commercial spokespersons in America. And if Arthur says it's good, it has to be. Well, now we're going to take you on a regularly scheduled flight from New York to Miami. Only this time, you're coming up in the cockpit with us, and we're going to show you what goes on behind the scenes. Well, Hugh, how are we fixed? Okay, sir. I'll see you on board. Good. Now, folks, I want you to meet my co-captain for today's trip. This is Captain Dick Merrill. Over 25 years with Eastern Airlines. One of the grandest guys, one of the best pilots who ever lived. I'm sure you know of his exploits as well as I do. To name one, he was the first pilot to fly a commercial flight across the Atlantic and return. What do you say, Captain? I say, Captain, let's check in at crew scheduling and then go look at the weather. I say we'll do it. Oh, boy, look at that beautiful high. Hmm. Yeah, but look at this front back here. See, how fast is that front moving? About 25 miles per hour to the east, Captain. Here's the latest map. Good. Thanks, Henry. Dick, let's fly down to 22,000. Sounds like a good altitude to me, Arthur. I'll go in and make out the flight plan. Okay. In this room, they get weather reports every hour on the hour from weather stations scattered all over the United States and Canada. There you are, sir. Flight 601, proposed 1400. The dispatcher's office is the central intelligence for all aircraft. They know where every plane is every minute. On this big board, the clerk notes the position of each plane en route, as reported by radio, and the time due at the next checkpoint. We fill out our flight plan with a dispatcher, giving our exact route of flight, the altitude, the amount of fuel, and so forth. A copy of this will be filed with the government airways traffic control. Here you are, sir. How does that look to you? The dispatcher gives us official clearance, and we're on our way. Everything OK, you? The ship is ready, sir. 88 passengers, Captain. Gross weight 112,000 pounds. Another full load, eh? Thanks, Al. That's what I like to see. Now, for you folks who've never been up on a flight deck before, this is it. The captain and the pilot have the flying controls at their fingertips at all times. While over here, the engineer is very busy with the engine instruments. These are the throttles. Just like the accelerators on your car, one for each engine. Two, three, four. This is the control column. And with it, you fly the airplane. To the right, to the left, down, up, and here are your rudder pedals down below. 
The airspeed indicator shows just that, how fast we are going through the air. The altimeter tells us how high we are. This vertical speed indicator tells us our rate of climb or descent. The automatic direction finder? Well, that's just what its name would imply. It points to where we want to go when we tune in a radio station with it. This is the flux gate compass. And this one is the old reliable magnetic compass, just like Columbus had when he came over here. This is the Omni Range bearing indicator. This is the localizer and glide path indicator, about which we'll talk a little bit more later. This is the artificial horizon. It shows the attitude of our plane with reference to the real horizon. And of course, you know that we have radio contact at all times, ship to ship, ship to ground, two or three transmitters and receivers. Now, this plane has already been very thoroughly checked by the maintenance department. And during the last hour, it was checked by our own flight engineer. But that's not enough. The pilot and the captain have one, two, three lists of checks to make before we start down the runway to take off. OK, Dick, we'll do the before starting engines check, huh? Right. Oxygen mask. Immediately available. Brake selector. And so on through yes. 39 separate yes, items. Yes. Now, you passengers wonder why we sit and wait sometimes at the end of the runway. It is because the captain and the co-pilot and the crew are making these additional last-minute checks. Well, I guess we're ready to wind them up, Dick. Now switch over to intercom and uh, talk to that gentleman outside there by the nose and get ready to start the engines. Ground to cockpit. Clear to start. Ready to start. Start three. Turning three. Contact three. Clear to start four. Start four. Turning four. As soon as the second engine starts, the ground crew checks with the cockpit. Hydraulic pressure up. Now the safety pins can be removed from the three landing wheels. Otherwise, they could not be retracted when the plane is in the air. Clear to start two. The same routine is followed for each engine. Clear to start one. When the engines are all turning, the cockpit team goes through another checklist routine. OK, Dick, let's do the before taxi and check. Flux gate. Cage. Hydraulic pressure. OK. Gear pins. Three pins. After that, he checks by radio with the airport ground control. I'll wire ground control from Eastern Airlines trip 601. Taxing instructions. Eastern 601, clear to taxi, clear to runway 13 right, 13 right, right, the wind south, southeast 10, altimeter 2997. Get the runway, Arthur, 15. 13, 13 right, right? Right. 13 right, okay. Ready to taxi? Brakes off. Control having given us permission, we taxi over to the warm-up block. You notice they told us which runway to use and the wind direction. At the warm-up block, we go through the next or before takeoff check. 
Trim tab. Set. Flight instruments. Okay. Fitted pitas. Off. Mixtures. Eleven Good. items are checked oh. this time. The last check before the plane leaves the ground. Ready to check mags. Right Number one. have been run up and checked. We are now ready for takeoff clearance. Idlewild Ground Control from Eastern 601, ready for clearance. Roger, Eastern 601, cleared for takeoff. All right, brakes off. Arthur Godfrey's co-pilot on this flight is Captain Dick Merrill. And while the name may not ring a bell with you now, in the 1950s, Captain Merrill was well known for his aviation exploits. In 1936, Captain Merrill and entertainer Harry James made the first round-trip flight between New York and London using a converted Vulti V1A airliner. The trip was covered extensively by the media at the time, and after it was over, Captain Merrill, who was chief pilot for Eastern Airlines at that time, achieved national fame. Overwater survival gear in the 30s was a lot cruder than it is nowadays. Merrill and Richmond filled the cabin of the converted airliner with gas tanks and with, for flotation, 41,000 ping pong balls. The flight became known in aviation history as the ping pong flight. Remember, this is a promotional film, a product endorsement for the Lockheed Super G Constellation. So as we return to Flying with Godfrey, be on the lookout for Arthur's other and most blatant product endorsement. There you are. See how easily she wanted to get off? Big as this Super Connie is, she wants to fly right on off of there. Veto power. Veto power. It's maximum except for takeoff. Flaps up. Flaps coming up. Flaps are extensions of the wing area used to give more lift during the slower speeds of takeoffs and landings. They withdraw in flight for greater speed. Climb power. Climb power. Finish our climb check. Now it's time for a Chesterfield. Dick. I don't smoke, Arthur. Don't smoke. Hugh. Okay, thanks. You get down on the deck, you buy them by the carton, see? Indubitably. Why? Uh, yeah. Er, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> I thought you wouldn't wrap your tongue around that one twice. Building up his par. Oh, boy. 
boy, this is the life. <laughs> hey, there goes that northbound Silver Falcon. That's one of Eastern Airlines' wonderful twin-engine planes. The new type that has superseded the beloved old DC-3. It's the most advanced twin-engine commercial plane in the air today. She carries 40 people at a cruising speed of around 300 miles an hour. One of the most comfortable airplanes you could ever ride in. Eastern uses them to pick up passengers from intermediate points to connect with these big super connies. It's a wonderful airplane, that Silver Falcon. Smells like the girls are getting ready to serve dinner back there. When the water's hot for tea, if anyone cares for anything. Thank you, Al. Like some dinner, sir? How about you, hen? Oh, this looks delicious. Okay, let's level off here. Cruise power. Cruise power. Now, people often ask me, I can figure out how you do this in good weather and over land, but how do you navigate when you're up over the clouds and over the ocean? Well, honestly, it's so simple, I, I hate to tell you. Well, for direction, we have the compass, the automatic direction finder, and the omni range receiver. Let me show you how that works. Take, take over for a minute, will you? Look, let me show you how it works. I'll fix this up here and draw you a little map. Let's come on down here. We draw the coastline down through Atlantic City, on down here to Wilmington, Myrtle Beach, on down the coast very crudely. We're flying along out here somewhere. We've got an Omni radio station here in Atlantic City. We've got another one here at Norfolk. And we've got another one down here at Myrtle Beach. So we tune in this station here. And on our little dial window I showed you a minute ago, it says that we bear from that station, say, 300 degrees. Well, we draw a line of 300 degrees magnetic true bearing right through that station, which extends out here somewhere. We are somewhere along that line, but where? Okay, so we tune in this next station down here. And that one says in the little window that we have got a bearing of, say, 260 degrees. So we draw a line through that station at 260 degrees true. And where those two lines cross, that is where we are, right there. A little snooze, a few hours have gone by, and we are now approaching Miami. Now we'll show you what takes place in our approach, in our landing. Time for us to start a gradual descent. But first, we have to get clearance to approach. Richard? Miami Tower from Eastern 601, 10 miles north. Eastern 601, 10 miles north at 1-1. One one. Make left turn in, runway 17, wind south 10, altimeter 2998. Okay, Dick, let's have about 60% flaps. Matt's coming 60. Gear down. Gear's coming down.
captain will reverse the pitch of the propellers and push the air forward and just stop the plane. There. You see, that acts as a powerful brake. So next time when you're riding in an airliner and you hear the engines roar soon after you're on the ground, remember that's what he's doing, reversing the props to stop the airplane. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was so happy with Arthur Godfrey's repeated endorsements of Eastern Airlines on the radio and on television, he authorized Godfrey being checked out in every airliner in Eastern's fleet, including the Martin 404. In fact, it could have been this Martin 404. The Airline History Museum at Kansas City has one of the very last Martin 404s in existence, and it used to fly for Eastern Airlines. We invite you to learn about this aircraft at our website at www.airlinehistorymuseum.com. And while you're there, we invite you to join our organization and help us preserve the history of propeller-driven commercial aviation. We return now to Flying with Godfrey. Well, here we are, right on schedule. I hope you folks enjoyed this as much as we did. Of course, this was purely and strictly a routine flight with beautiful weather. But maybe we've been able to show you some things you hadn't seen before. But you know, I'll bet you right now, some of you are saying, well, sure, this was nice, it was lovely weather, but what happens when the weather is bad? Well, believe me, it's still routine. You see, in the first place, up where these super connies do most of the flying, the weather's always nice, way up on top of all the bad weather. Usually it's only on approaches to our airports that weather becomes any problem, and then not much. Long as we have a half a mile of visibility and 200 foot of ceiling, no problem at all. Now these minimums are arbitrarily set up by the Civil Aeronautics Administration in the interest of general safety. Actually, we can land one of these airplanes when the minimums are zero, zero. Let me show you. Here we are flying on instruments. We're in the clouds. It's one of those nights that the birds aren't even walking. We have been cleared to make an instrument approach. We have been cleared to the outer marker. This point we call the outer marker is located approximately five miles from the end of the runway. A light flashes on the cockpit panel. At the same time, the ADF needle indicates the passage of the marker, and we also get an audio signal. And at this point, the glide path is intercepted. The glide path is a sloping radio beacon down which the aircraft should make its descent to the runway and is indicated by the horizontal needle. When the needle is centered, the aircraft is on the glide path. If the needle moves above center, the aircraft is low and must climb back to the path. If the needle is below center, we're high on the glide path. This is a big help in itself. But in addition to the ILS, the instrument landing system, we have GCA, that is ground control approach, and that can give additional valuable assistance. Radar monitoring on uh, localizer voice as you approach the outer marker. By means of this radar, the GCA controller sees the approaching plane as a bit of light moving on his scope and can direct it safely to the airport. When the flight has been directed to the approach course, it is turned over to the radar monitor for final approach. Radar to Eastern, you're approaching the ILS course. Turn to a heading of 247, and I'm turning you over to the radar monitor for a final approach. This is radar monitor. Etched right on the scope is both glide path and localizer, and any deviation can be detected and measured in feet. You are four miles from the end of the runway. 200 feet to the right, of course, but correcting nicely. Your glide path is good.
You are three miles from the end of the runway. Your course is good. Flight path slightly low, but okay. You are two miles from the end of the runway. Your course is good. You're now approaching the middle marker. You're over the middle marker. The approach light should be coming into view. Approach lights in view. Thank you, GCA. That column of lights ahead shows the approach to the end of the airport runway. Each bar of light is 100 feet apart, and that ball of light traveling away from us at such a high rate of speed is leading us right to the approach end of the runway itself. The green lights mark the start of the runway, and the border lights on each side stretching out into the distance outline a mile and a half of airstrip just waiting for us to land on. So you see, it really isn't too difficult. Actually, we use these landing aids every day in good weather and bad to keep in practice. And practically all of the airports that we use are equipped with them. The thing to remember is that it's all figured out. Nothing is guesswork. It's still routine. Another quick story about Captain Eddie. There were no autopilots on any Eastern Airlines airliner until the introduction of the DC-7 into the fleet. This long after other airlines had introduced autopilots. The reasoning? Well, as Captain Eddie saw it, he was paying the pilots to fly, not the autopilots. Now I'm going to show you the most amazing demonstration of power in an airplane you've ever seen. Let's go back upstairs. Now watch this. Feather one. Feather one. Feather two. Feather two. Look at that, on two engines. Parent along just like a kitten. You haven't seen anything yet. Feather three. Feather three. Boy, oh boy, look at that. On one engine. Going along just as steady as you like. Only a constellation can do this. Why do we have all that tremendous reserve of power? Because, my friends, power means safety. That's why this super constellation is the most dependable airliner in the world today. Okay, Hugh, bring in one. Unfeathering one. engines are not only the best that money can buy, but they are maintained by the finest bunch of aviation mechanics in the world, trained for years by Eastern. You know, you can have the best captains and the best pilots in the world, but they can't do much good if the engines don't run. We've got the best mechanics in the business in Eastern. Doesn't that inspire confidence? I think it does. dreams, I guess. I never did aspire to own an airline, but I always wanted an airplane of my own, even when I was a kid. I've got two of them now, a DC-3 and a Navion, and there are thousands of privately owned airplanes all over America today. 
This is the little airport or landing strip that I use when I fly home to Virginia. That's my Navy on coming in there, a single engine plane. We can go most anywhere in it. It has all the technical facilities and instruments that the big planes have. Besides the Navy on, I have a DC-3. That's my Air Force. We call this little field the Leesburg International Cow Pasture. Cows out there give a hundred octane milk. Of course, these are reciprocating engines here. We have the regular jet engines like we use in our military aircraft. This is a Lockheed F-94C Starfire. It's an Air Force jet-propelled fighter. You see, these jet engines, contrary to what I'm afraid is too popular a belief, are not the lethal things they're cracked up to be. As a matter of fact, they're so quiet and so vibrationless that to ride behind one of them is a real comfort. We're hoping someday soon that our commercial transports will be jet propelled. You see, a jet engine has no propeller. The air is drawn in through the intake ducts just forward of the wings compressed and mixed with burning fuels to produce a powerful jet of exhaust gases which are expelled aft. The mechanism involved in reality is much simpler. The propeller is replaced by an air compressor. There's a combustion chamber into which we inject fuel to expand the air and increase its velocity and installed in the path of the exhaust gases is a turbine to drive the compressor. There you have it. This is my friend Tommy Daniels, a member of our Air Forces for 12 years. Tommy is one of the thousands of fine young men who are making a career out of the Air Force, taking advantage of the wonderful training they receive. How do you like it, Tommy? It couldn't be better, Mr. Godfrey. It's really wonderful. Now I'm going to have the pleasure of flying with Tommy today in some very exciting scenes. So Tommy, what are we going to do? Well, Mr. Godfrey, I'd like to take you through some pull-ups to show you just what this airplane is designed to do in climbing to altitude rapidly. I'm sure you'll enjoy it, but it's just routine flying to us. We do it every day. Now, before we take off, I would like to have your friends take a look at the afterburner in the tail section that gives this airplane this terrific wallop. Okay, Tommy, we'll do it. This Lockheed Starfire is an all-weather Air Force interceptor. She was designed especially to get off the ground quickly and climb to altitude very quickly in the hope of being able to intercept and stop any enemy bombers that might come over this way. To help her get up there quickly, she was designed with this afterburner in the tail section, which is why this tail section is so much bigger than any other jet you've probably seen. See, there's an auxiliary engine back in here that uses exhaust gases as they pass through and reburn them with greater efficiency, giving additional thrust to the engine. That really is something to watch it. Get off quickly and climb to altitude, boy, oh boy. I want to show you what I mean, so we're going to fly by first on the regular jet, and so you can see and hear how it performs. And then we're going to fly by with the afterburner on. And you'll hear that, well, you'll see for yourself. You just watch. Okay, Tommy, let her go.
We're approaching you now on straight jet. Watch our rate of climb. Now we are approaching with the afterburner in operation. Watch the increase in this climb. Well, how'd you like it, Mr. Godfrey? <laughs> Boy, my pants are where my necktie ought to be. But it was wonderful. Gee, what a dive. Woo! That's just a sample of what this airplane can do, Mr. Godfrey. Thank you, Tommy. And this airplane can do much more, as we're going to see. Yes, and here comes the man now who's going to do it. And here is the chief test pilot for Lockheed, my good friend, Tony Levick. Hello, Arthur. It's good to see you. Well, if you think those pull-ups were something, Arthur, just watch and I'll show you how easy it is to penetrate the sound barrier with this airplane. I wasn't with Tony on this flight, but we have a camera specially rigged on the tail to give you a close-up view of what happens when you break the sound barrier. Let me tell you what to watch for. First, notice the deep color of the sky, how much darker it is at 45,000 feet where Tony will start his dive. You are not only far above the clouds, but also above the haze and dust of the lower atmosphere. You are looking at the pure ultraviolet rays of outer space. There's the peel off. Now listen as the sound builds up. Usually, there are two thunderclaps. One, when the plane runs away from its sound, and the second, when the sound catches up again. Between the two, you are flying faster than the speed of sound, and it is absolutely silent. Now the sound is building up. The sound barrier has been broken. This is the silence of supersonic flight. Now the pullout is being made. Listen to the noise when the sound catches up. Now you folks have just seen some very spectacular flying. But the point I'd like to make to you is this, that as spectacular as it looks, it's not foolhardy, not without purpose. This airplane was built to take that kind of a strain. I'll say it was, Arthur. You know, even when you're flying faster than the speed of sound, this business of flying in our air forces is carefully figured out to the last detail. We take nothing but calculated risks. Calculated risks, you know. Our equipment is the very best. It's built to fly. You wouldn't make dives and pullouts like that with a transport plane that wasn't built to do that. This kind of an airplane was. Why, we were climbing up out of that dive there at the rate of about 45,000 feet a minute for a few seconds. Even our big bombers, the B-52, the B-47s, they fly so fast, and yet they're built to fly strong, and they've all the bugs been worked out of them. So that really, it, it isn't something spectacular, this business of flying so fast. It's done every day by personnel that's trained very carefully, by men who are competent to train the youngsters coming along. Your son that joins the Air Force or the Naval Air Service, never fear but what he'll get the very best possible instruction, that every precaution will be made to look out for his safety. Sure, there's danger to it. There's danger to crossing the street it takes a special breed of cat to fly these things. This, this can't be done by any namby-pamby. That's why all the men you know who are pilots are such wonderful young men. You young fellas looking for adventure, looking for real life, something you love every minute of it, you go and see the nearest Air Force recruiting officer or the nearest Naval officer procurement station or the nearest air station someplace. Talk to him about it. It's a wonderful life. You love the years that you spend there. And you'll use the experience all the rest of your days. Join up. We need you. Besides his radio and television legacy, 
Arthur Godfrey is known, in aviation circles at least, for one particular incident, the time that he buzzed the Teterboro Tower in his DC-3, an aircraft much like this DC-3. Now, why did he do this? Well, Arthur was not happy with the departure runway clearance he got from the controllers. He came so close, they say, that the staff had to duck. For this expression of emotion, Arthur got a six-month suspension. Our DC-3 is not known for buzzing towers. It is known for being one of the original TWA DC-3s. It's undergoing a complete restoration here at Downtown Airport in Kansas City, and you can help us put this aircraft in the air where it belongs by calling the number on the screen or looking us up on the web at www.airlinehistorymuseum.com. We'll return you now to Flying with Godfrey, but be listening for Captain Eddie's vision of the future of air transportation. Hello, Art. Well, Rick, we've told the story pretty good up to now, I think. What would you say we can look forward to in the next few years? Well, Arthur, you've been talking about jets. You know, it won't be long until we'll be flying from New York to Miami in a matter of two hours, San Francisco in five, and to London in five to five and a half hours, and at altitudes from 35,000 feet to 45,000 feet. In fact, we'll be landing and taking off in most any kind of weather. Well, that's fine. That's wonderful, Rick. Our planes are flying faster all the time. But what are we going to do about this business of getting from the airport to town and from town to the airport? Doggone, sometimes it takes you longer to do that than it does to fly where you're going. I know. And we're going to be doing something about that too, Arthur. It won't be long until you'll be going to your midtown terminal. There you'll step into a express elevator and be whisked to the top of the building. There a commodious helicopter will be awaiting to take you baggage and all and deposit you at the main airport in just a matter of minutes. And not only from downtown, Arthur, we're going to have feeder lines of helicopters coming in from all the surrounding communities. We're going to make flying better and faster. We're going to make flying available to still more people. Well, Rick, it's been a lot of fun. And a rare privilege and a great honor to do this with you. I've learned a lot, and I hope we've done some good. I'm sure of it, Arthur. Good luck. God bless you always, Captain Godfrey. Thank you, Rick. Well, it was a real nice trip, kid. Captain Dick Merrill, it was a rare privilege to fly with you today. Well, Arthur, I couldn't have been with a better captain. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen and Helen, for a very pleasant trip. Hugh, Hugh Palmer, the grand flight engineer. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Captain. Grand trip. So remember, when you want to fly anywhere in the world, call Eastern Airlines. If one of our planes doesn't go where you want to go, we'll put you on one that does. And I'll be seeing you, be the good Lord willing. Arthur Godfrey went on to become a spokesperson for cancer research. He flew around the world, again joining Captain Dick Merrill, this time in the cockpit of a Rockwell Jet Commander. The trip itself took 55 hours and 30 minutes. He fought against the development of the SST supersonic airliner on the grounds of environmental concerns. He fought for the Boeing B-1 bomber. And he was always a staunch proponent of general aviation. Arthur Godfrey is now enshrined in the National Aviation Hall of Fame, an honor this performer and aviator richly deserved. Arthur Godfrey died in 1983 at the age of 79. We thank you for joining us for this look back at aviation history and invite you to join the Airline History Museum at Kansas City by calling us on the number on the screen or looking us up on the web at www.airlinehistorymuseum.com you can help preserve aviation history. Kansas City is famed for its excellent facilities for air transportation, our municipal airport being only a short drive from the center of town. The air terminal is a model of modern travel accommodations and hundreds of passengers pass through the handsome administration building every day. The major airlines which service our town bring the rest of the country, in fact, the rest of the world within easy reach of the traveler. 
Contributing greatly to the advancement of global transportation is Transworld Airlines Incorporated, a pioneer in airborne travel and a major carrier of passengers to and from our town. The job of keeping TWA's fleet of swift airliners operating smoothly is no small matter. Cruising above the clouds at 300 miles an hour may look simple to us, but plenty of work has to be done on the ground to keep these silver giants in the air. Conscientious maintenance is strictly enforced by the company, and their safety record is an impressive testimony to the efficiency of the ground crews. Each of the big ships follows a rigid schedule of checkup and overhaul, and no flight is allowed to proceed without first having a thorough inspection to see that everything is up to par. When a TWA constellation soars high above us, we know it's made possible through the work of many experienced specialists. The combined skills of some 6,000 operations, maintenance, and office workers in the Kansas City area serve to bring the rest of the world near, helping us to travel quickly and safely. Activity inside the overhaul hangars at our municipal airport is a graphic example of what goes on behind the smooth flight of a big constellation. The scene may look pretty hectic to an outsider, but everybody here knows his job thoroughly. Months and years of training have gone to making each mechanic an expert in his field. These workmen can tear a plane down to its barest essentials and build it back again, ready for many more thousands of miles of service. The Kansas City shops handle the overhaul on the 175 TWA planes that fly the 33,000 route miles from San Francisco to Ceylon. The company has set up here the most advanced airline overhaul base in the world. Like everything else in our town, the work is done expertly and on a big scale. When a plane rolls out of the hangar, it's ready to carry a full load of passengers halfway around the world in just a matter of hours. To take a businessman to New York or a vacationing secretary to California. More than 320 takeoffs and landings each week are made by TWA planes from the Kansas City Airport. We can travel nonstop any day of the week to Los Angeles or New York, and the charm of Paris is only 19 hours away from our town. The company provides us with real convenience in their well-planned schedules. The first spin of the propellers heralds an exciting adventure high above the clouds. The broad runways of our expansive airfield give the big planes plenty of room to pick up speed for the takeoff. As the ship taxis across the field, the promise of colorful new vistas begin to materialize. We're on our way to interesting new places to collect memories we'll cherish for a lifetime. Down the runway it roars. Many years of intensive development have gone into this modern master of the skies. Flight through the air has been a dream of man for ages, and now, in the 20th century, the dream has been realized, and today's scientific and technological inventiveness continues to conquer new horizons every day. TWA flies to romantic lands. The mystery and adventure of far-off countries is near at hand when we travel by plane, Suddenly, we're actually among the peoples and customs that we first learned about as school children. We become part of the carefree, glamorous life of Paris in the spring. Its fabled sights dance before our eyes. Rome, the eternal city, comes to vivid life and caps our journey with the splendor of an ancient civilization. Yes, memorable travel is made convenient, comfortable, and safe through Transworld Airlines. And although we may travel to far off places, we know we'll always return to the friendly sights and faces, the ever-growing, ever-changing pace, for this is our town, Kansas City, USA, the heart of America.